Thank you all for, uh, for having me to address this esteemed crowd. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Everybody, thumbs up. You know, for someone who spends a lot of time trying to think through the future and to do so usefully, uh, which means trying to be as realistic as possible when you're making stuff up. This has been a fantastic day so far, and, uh, and I hope this is a useful conversation that, that we have now in talking a bit about not only the method of using science fiction, using video games and film to think about the future, but also some of those visions themselves. Um, if I were to ask the room, how many people have played a video game in the past week? Raise your hand. That's extraordinary. That's the most amount of people who have raised their hands since I addressed an audience in the intelligence community. <laughs> what about who's read a white paper in the last week? That's pretty good, too. You guys are doing your homework. What would you rather do right now if you had a choice? <laughs> I don't know. You probably have a lot of history buffs in the room like me, but this is from a game called Battlefield One, which is unlike a lot of the really future-oriented games, a throwback. It's fairly retro. Uh, it is, of course, about the First World War, and there is you know, horse cavalry jumping over a trench. Uh, I actually think it's one of the best games for thinking about the future of war in terms of how they've designed the, the gaming experience. Very much uh, in the middle of the game, you're often asked to stop and kind of reflect on what industrialization is bringing to the battlefield at the turn, effectively, of the 20th century. And now at the second decade, really, of the 21st century, we are on the cusp of a variety of breakthroughs, many of which have been detailed today, that'll be as profound as internal combustion, uh, as profound as the machine gun, to the way we think and conceive of our militaries is that that cavalry rider there uh, you know, may have a similar outcome in terms of being obsolete uh, sooner maybe than we, than we think. You know, when I talk about video games, uh, people sometimes think it's a bit of a stretch. But the amount of effort and energy that goes into these games, whether it's Battlefield 1 or the more future-minded games, it's worth understanding that they occupy an important place in our conversations about the future. The, the rigor behind these is extraordinary when you talk to a video game director. I actually had a, a really interesting experience uh, giving a talk in London. A young Turkish gentleman came up to me uh, after I'd shown uh, that slide from Battlefield 1 and said, you know what, in that game, they talk just like my great-grandparents. Meaning the game designers had gotten the dialect right from his region, and not only in a geographic sense, but in a historical sense, which is extraordinary. Now this is Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, which is a forward-looking game set in the future. It has all the kind of tick-the-box, you know, blockbuster game qualities, space combat, Navy SEALs fly space fighters, uh, you know, robot partners, the, the elements that draw in young players, but also I think can, can interest us, us older ones here too. One of the, my favorite parts about this game is a moment in it, I don't know if any of you have played it, but, but you have a robot partner who's a, you know, a humanoid, and it's effectively like your, your battle buddy. And at one point, it makes a joke about another robot that went crazy and killed its companions. And, and that sort of like dark humor, which seems to me realistic in terms of how we will view technology and interact with technology in the future, really struck me because it was almost the, the game stepping back outside of itself for a moment. You know, that sort of really engaging, uh, really exciting way to experience a conversation about the future through something like this is going to be increasingly important for the efforts of people like you to relate to the users of the future, whether they're civilians or in uniform. You know, we are at this point where the pace of technological development, the pace of our understanding of what's going around us socially, if not politically, it's outstripping our, our normal analytical tools. And yet these really enduring human elements, as that joke, I think, ex, 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 you know, exhibits in, in uh, Infinite Warfare, these enduring human elements is, are, aren't going away. You know, that there are these qualities to conflict, to the human experience, that technology will change, even as we change our bodies increasingly, uh, with the technologies we either carry in our pockets today or may further integrate into our, into our own systems. We need to be able to be entertained and engaged in a way to really never lose sight of that human element despite all this technological wizardry and wonder. So what are the tools that we have out there? What the Mad Scientist Initiative recently kicked off 
an extraordinary contest. Something that we've done at Art of the Future Project, except they've been wildly successful with over 150 entries of people stepping back to stop and write about what their vision of the future of 2030 to 2050 looks like. That kind of turnout, that kind of official and unofficial enthusiasm for taking time to write is a really good sign. You know, there was a recent essay in uh, the Strategy Bridge, which is a website that I'd recommend uh, many of you who aren't familiar with it to familiarize yourself with, which features some of the best young and up and coming military thinkers, but talking about the importance of military uh, community to be thoroughly engaged in this conversation about the future because it's going to be a discriminating advantage uh, relative to, to, to adversaries. Now we're, we're at this point though, when we look at efforts like this, is happening not as all or nothing, but as components of a larger conversation. And the tools we have in that conversation, of course, like I said, range from popular media, but you know, the white paper has, has its place too. So what's the white paper good for, right? This talk is literally titled Death of the White Paper. It's not death to the white paper, to be clear. It's death of the white paper. You know, the white paper is targeted. It allows us to showcase expertise uh, in a way that we are familiar with and comfortable with. It's officially uh, you know, acknowledged as something that has a lot of credibility because when you print that out, it's heavy. Um, it helps you get to sleep. You know, Max Brooks, who's one of the fellows at the council, referred to white papers as printed Ambien. So for those of you who are international travelers, I'm sure you've had that experience. Uh, a thriller novel will not let you sleep if you're flying to South Korea, but uh, a white paper might. So they don't travel well, white papers. And our attention spans are limited. You know, I think right now there's some, I don't know if it's dubious science or not, but we know we're distracted and the current you know, level of human attention span is supposed to be something like you know, less than a goldfish, maybe eight or nine seconds. I don't know if that's actually true, but we know anecdotally that it feels right. I mean, you know, half of you guys are probably on your phones right now trying, to, uh, trying to, to kind of either tweet what we're saying you know, today or just keep abreast of things. So how do you do that deep thinking? How do you get so engaged in a, in a world that all you want to do is spend time there? You know, and, and creating that world is one way to do so. You know, these status quo approaches, though, don't allow us to do that both in writing or in reading. And we, again, miss that human element often as we try to focus on policy, as we try to focus on the, L, the aspects that are organizationally uh, important, but often individually don't connect us to each other as we try to figure out the future. You know, I think also there's this notion that expertise is narrow, and it is, but we're also seeing the power of the crowd. You know, the power of the swarm, if you want to call it that. This technology, so to speak, of crowdsourcing that the Mad Scientist Initiative has implemented, you know, shows that it's effective. We've been uh, playing with this with Art of the Future project for a couple of years now, reaching out to different communities. And when you create these sort of open doors for people to showcase and share their work, to uh, highlight what's exemplary, to be able to introduce it into official channels, it's incredibly powerful and it's also quite durable. And that is important because we're needing these sorts of networks more and more to come up with the answers that we need. If you're a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, a few of them, at least in particular, are, are famous for meeting with literally anybody. And if they're not going to fund you, they're going to refer you to someone else who might want to have a conversation with you. That sort of approach to the ideas and insights into the future, whether it's of conflict or society, are something that we can think about and emulate as we address these sort of creative communities that have a lot of insight into that. Because we do need to reach the young. We need to reach the people whose voices aren't heard as often. We need to reach internationally. Uh, it was very interesting to see the ACLU recently launched a comic book uh, at the end of last year about a lawsuit uh, with the NSA to explain what they were doing and why. Again, a very distinct approach to challenging uh, you know, an established uh, organization and communicating that message in an unconventional manner. Uh, those sorts of ways that we express our own missions are going to be really, really valuable for not only our internal communities, but beyond. And there's this larger point that there is this recognition that artists are effectively an underappreciated strategic asset in thinking about the future. It's something that we uh, began experimenting with about two and a half years ago when we started the Art of the Future project as an open-ended question. Was, that, was this going to be true? What, do artists have something to offer the national security community? And with many of the same principles that you would apply to prototyping and design thinking or others, we set about to experiment. Uh, by reaching out to communities who weren't necessarily 
brought into the conversation. So when we want to talk about megacity warfare, queuing off some of the TRADOC, for example, uh, writing about uh, a year and a half ago, we brought in graphic novelists and Max Brooks, who had written World War Z, which is probably one of the most insightful uh, you know, pieces of writing, I think, on, on urban combat, at least from my perspective, in the fictional realm that we've seen in a long time. And over time, we've seen that momentum start to build. We've seen recognition and interest grow because A, this is fun, but B, there's a sense that it's useful. You know, this tension between an idea that is entertaining and useful doesn't have to be as acute as we want it to be. And so the, the website that we run becomes a cornerstone of the Art of the Future project, a digital place where we can go. Again, this is a, a really valuable way to connect with people because it allows us to showcase its external. Uh, it is something that is both able to be enjoyed passively, but yet when the moment you contribute to it, you're part of something much bigger than yourself, and that energizes people more, further cementing them, them into your network. And the voices you bring in are really important. You know, this is right here uh, a cover for the Marine Corps Futures document put out by their Warfighting Lab Futures Directorate. Now, they do this survey of the future operating environment based off of uh, a variety of different uh, projections about the world of the coming decades. And they do really good work. And it's incredibly important to the organization for funding, for planning, for, for training. But there's a real, there was a real concern that not enough people were actually going to get into it and read it. So with the help of one of the military fellows at the Atlantic Council, uh, Colonel John Dunn, we started talking to the warfighting lab about potentially working with some of this science fiction technology to make it richer. And so we actually held an event at Quantico for a day. We brought in Matt Burroughs, who's one of our former uh, National Intelligence Council officials who's at the Atlantic Council to talk about futures. We brought in Max Brooks, who'd since become a fellow. Uh, Charles Gannon, another great science hard science fiction writer to run essentially writing workshops to bring the different scenarios to life that the Marine Corps had been talking about in its futures document. But what's singularly unique about this engagement, and I would encourage you to think about this, is that the Marines sent out an all-MAR admin note to the entire force. I had a friend send it to me in disbelief that essentially said, if you're an accomplished writer, if you think you can write science fiction, you can submit a sample, and we will see about selecting you to be one of essentially 18 to 19 service members who are going to come and work at this day-long workshop, and then afterwards commit to writing some of these vignettes for our MixF document. And they had, I think, almost 100 Marines submit. Got some extraordinary writers, and, and some non-Marines too came as well. And in the end, after that workshop, after that day-long session and the, the editing work that went in both on their part, but also on, on our part with the, the writers that were engaged, produced this document that has become, I think, a touchstone for showing that there can be buy-in from on high. General Dale Alford came to the council, talked about the value of this project, and also those who were brought in to participate in this, like the 19-year-old who had been on embassy duty in, I think it was Cyprus, they flew him for essentially a day to come participate in the workshop and fly back. So the organizational commitment that goes with this is coming. And part of the value in this is that we're not doing things the same old way again. That we are bringing in new voices. That we're creating these sorts of avenues for a screenwriter in Los Angeles to sit down with Greg Treverton, the head of the National Intelligence Council, uh, at, a, at a talent agency in, in LA, and have a conversation about future scenarios. You know, the kind of engagement that we're starting to think about uh, doing allows us to put people in a room who don't belong together. You know, we're, and that, I think, is one of the really important elements in any of these approaches to really thinking creatively about the future is to not have everybody in the room be the kind of person that's supposed to be there. I like to try to tell people, invite folks who don't belong. And, and with everything that we do, we try to always have that in the back of our mind. Are we pushing far enough to bring in somebody who, who doesn't have that kind of perspective that would otherwise be heard? And so some of the people who've been drawn to this, who we've been able to work with, include, of course, the, the Warfighting Lab, the NIC, the Global Risks Report the Council puts out about the year 2035 extensively featured a large amount of fiction in it. And the reason, uh, references to some of the short story contests that we ran with it, and the reason is Matt Burroughs, who had written some prior Nick Global Trends documents for, for the government, had found that in his long career in the intelligence community, one of the best ways to capture 
someone's attention was with a short story, and especially when you're dealing with the future. So to have that kind of advocate uh, behind you gives you a really great tailwind. We've worked with uh, the VA, we worked with Deputy Secretary uh, Bob, Secretary Bob Work's office on the third offset, and other organizations as well. So like I said, the world is changing so quickly, so what tools do we have there to respond to it? I've often joked that you know, some of the short stories that are out there could be equivalent to the value of a predictive uh, intelligence report. Is it ficant? Are we going to get to a point where you know, an intelligence analysis includes this in some of the briefings that we're going to see? And I would argue that you can make the case that, that you will. Because of the pace of change of technology, like I said earlier, society, demography, and our own inability to respond with the same sort of speed that we feel in, at a gut level we know we need to have. I know this is working at a personal level because this year I've been lucky enough to work with two of our fellows at the council, who a uh, Marine colonel and an Army colonel, who instead of doing a traditional white paper or research project, uh, have each decided to write science fiction. Making that professional step to say, I'm actually going to commit part of this privileged time I've been given to do some serious writing and research on the very issues we're talking about here today, AI and robotics. You know, what will the field of battle be like? How will my service fight? Where will it be relevant? Where will it fall short? Who will be the heroes? Who will be the villains? And it's been a real honor to work with them because they've been able to show that this is a concept that has real value. So when, when uh, our Army officer, Brian Michelson, uh, you know, published his, the first version of one of his short stories the other day, uh, The Death of Homer, it was very much about the relationship, and I encourage you to read it at the Art of the Future website, it was very much about the relationship between an officer and the, and the robots under, under her command. But what he also did, which was really, really smart, because Brian's an incredibly bright guy, was to write an analytical piece that went with it. Uh, essentially saying that, again, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to think creatively and, and holistically about the future of conflict will be a decisive advantage, akin to the way Blitzkrieg uh, was able to integrate different capabilities in the 20th century. You know, that sort of, an, of a concept to link the factual and the fictional is incredibly powerful and shows that you're able to derive something that will be useful, hopefully, to Army leadership. Our Marine uh, fellow started off with an incredible head of steam, and I asked him to write a 5,000-word short story, so, of course, being a hard charger, he wrote 30,000 words, effectively a novella. And he's now set the next target as 80 to 90,000 words for a novel. That's an incredible professional commitment. And it's not that it's not fun, it is enjoyable. But it is unlocking the kind of thinking that they feel is absolutely professionally necessary. You know, when you go to a whiteboard in, in the office that these two fellows share and see the kinds of concepts, the kinds of theories and principles that they're debating in their different colored dry erase board markers, it's extraordinary and really humbling to see that kind of energy. And that's what you want to see spread throughout not people who necessarily would otherwise be bureaucratically inclined to do that because their bosses, nobody told them to do this. This is all internal to them. There's some precedent for this mode of using fiction to really think about the unthinkable. I'm sure a lot of you read Red Storm Rising. Um, you know, for me, I read that at a young age and with my co-writer Pete Singer on Ghost Fleet, both of us, that was our touchstone. We wanted to have that effect on not only a reader who was, who was young, but also on officialdom to really capture people's attention and do something that was going to be made up but useful. You know, useful fiction is the label that we tend to try to apply to what we've been doing because we want to, through endnotes, through research, through, through the seriousness with which we take the, the task of, of building these worlds of the future, we want to make this useful as an aid in thinking through the conflicts of tomorrow. And so what Tom Clancy did, and what's really interesting, I don't know if many of you know this, but Larry Bond, who's gone on to have a, a successful career as a writer as well, co-wrote Red Storm Rising with Tom Clancy. His name didn't make the cover, uh, but was an integral part of the book. And their method was quite interesting because uh, Larry Bond is, is a really talented game designer and a sim designer. And so they actually would war game again and again and again, the naval battles particularly in the North Atlantic that were integral to the, to the book. But what, I, what I found really unique about the book, though, was the fact that it took you on so many different stops 
on this future battlefield. If you did a staff ride of like Red Storm Rising, you would be on an airplane, you know, logging tens of thousands of miles. The same with Ghost Fleet. If you did a staff ride of Ghost Fleet, you know, you'd be spending time in low Earth orbit, you'd be in Hawaii, you'd be in China, you'd be on the, in the home front here. Because you're, you're talking about a fairly complex thing, a third world war. How do you encapsulate that in a handful of pages or even in a video game that lasts 20 hours? There's a lot that you need to unpack and integrate and fuse together. But yet this is actually what these sorts of fictional stories do really well. Because we relate to them at a character level, at a human level. You know, these aren't abstract policy ideas. These are about people experiencing these situations and you're seeing them through their eyes. When you want to take those people to places that we're not allowed to go or would get in a lot of trouble or catch a lot of flack for, for experiencing or talking about, how do you talk about the cyber vulnerabilities of our most expensive weapon systems? How do you put yourself in the shoes or the sandals of an American insurgent employing the same tactics that our adversaries do today? How do you interface with the private sector in a context where government can't react in time or rapidly enough to meet the demands of a future conflict. That's why we have space pirates in, this, in, in Ghost Fleet. We started thinking through, what are the billionaires who are leading the charge of commercial, space commercialization actually gonna do if we get into a conflict with China? Are we gonna be in a situation where we set back and aren't able to respond to the sorts of attacks we would expect to see on our you know, satellite capabilities? Or are we gonna see new heroes emerge? Because every story obviously comes down to, as it always has, a hero and a villain. And your hero is only as good as your villains. And so you're constantly trying to figure out how to get your best characters to walk that line between good and bad, and your worst characters, your most evil characters, to have those signs of being possibly good. And so the, the reaction that we finally saw with Ghost Fleet was really interesting because we've seen it taken seriously again. We've seen it become a tool through which people can have these conversations that are uncomfortable, that allows them to talk about vulnerabilities in supply chain manufacturing, uh, hardware hacking, ethics and laws around autonomous systems on the battlefield. The Navy is named, and I don't know if it's directly related to the book or not, but its latest autonomous undersea and surface uh, campaign Ghost fleet, right? How do we visualize some of this in the same way Clancy and Bond did uh, a generation ago, you know, for this new era of warfare? The way that we think about the really big threats that aren't just about what we know is dangerous. This is a, a poster that was made as part of a larger uh, exhibition that we worked on with Ghost Fleet about Propaganda of the Next World War. See if I can get this, stop advancing on me here. Um, Chris Martin and Ben Morrow. Chris Martin is a writer. He's written about special operations community, he writes a lot about motorcycle racing. Ben Morrow's a, a graphic novelist. They created a story that was about essentially China taking, I don't want to spoil it too much because I'd, I'd hardly recommend you, you read it, called Engines of Extinction. And it's about China having a technological edge that we're wholly unaware of, that is so game changing that we literally have nothing to respond with until we decide we have to break all the rules to get, to get through it. And it's about you know, private military contactors, about nano. It's, it's a phenomenal series because it ca encapsulates this extreme existential challenge. And there's a lot of other work out there that does so with even farther out threats. Uh, there's two books in particular when you start thinking about existential risk Seven Eves by the writer uh, Neil Stevenson, and Three Body Problem by uh, a Chinese writer, Yushi Shin. Seven Eves, uh, which was originally recommended to me by uh, Admiral James Stavridis, is a book about an interstellar, or a, a calamity, I should say, in, in orbit. The, the, we lose the moon, and then what? How does humanity save itself? Can you save humanity? How do you respond scientifically, bureaucratically, militarily? Uh, Liu Xi Shin's book, The Three-Body Problem, which is a trilogy uh, picked up by Obama, of all people, too, is uh, based on the notion of the ultimate existential threat. Imagine you learned that an alien civilization was coming 
sublight speed to Earth about 300 years out would arrive and wipe, try to wipe us out. What do we do? The lessons in both of those books about, again, this human element, and, and yet both are rooted in very serious science, are incredibly important because it shows you quite realistically how far we actually have to come in coping with these kinds of challenges. And it's not just worrying about, again, great power conflict, but that there are other uh, hurdles that we're gonna have to potentially overcome, not only as nations or organizations like the Army, but as, as literally species, uh, that can be seen as metaphor for, of course, other, other threats that we face too. But they're, but they're extremely important as thought experiments to start to say, well, how would we measure up? How would we handle this? You know, there is a lot of, I think, past precedent, of course, for science fiction in the military canon. Starship Troopers uh, was one we were just talking about at lunch, which is a phenomenal Robert Heinlein story, of course, that many of you have read, I'm sure. Ender's Game is another. But I would introduce these other books, hopefully, into the kind of 21st century canon uh, that allows us to have conversations about really big risks, really big threats that we haven't yet had. We've seen you know, Robert Goddard, uh, of course, who was inspired by H.G. Uh, Wells' War of the Worlds, you know, Danger by Arthur Conan Doyle, talked about unrestricted undersea warfare before that was considered possible. The Great Pacific War by Hector Bywater talked about the Second World War in the Pacific, of course, many of the, the, the dynamics there. You know, and our Talos suits uh, with Iron Man are something that, that have been around really since 1963 when that comic book debuted. So the artistic creation of an idea and the, the actual implementation of it, of course, still can take a while to get there. But if you notice, though, as we look around at the magic we carry in our pockets technologically, that, that delta, that time gap is getting narrower and narrower. We're, we're still not to Jetsons flying cars yet, but you know, the Chinese have developed a single-person quadcopter that could be used for everything from you know, casualty evacuation to getting you know, around the Beltway in D.C. Uh, those are the sorts of changes that, that I think we're going to start to, to see. Our monopoly on new technology, both as a nation, as has been said, so much of this is open source, it's being stolen, can't, can't let us believe for a minute that our technological dominance and supremacy is assured. You know, this is one of the ways, again, that fiction can allow us to experiment. What would it look like if you had to confront on the battlefield something akin to our Boston Dynamics big dog robot, but in fact is you know, the Chinese counterpart. You know, our ability to be able to have those sorts of exercises, war games, are one thing behind closed doors, but the moment you open those up to a larger audience, you start to get more innovative ideas. You start to get more fresh air and more concepts uh, surface that you might not have come, come at uh, if you'd gone out about it the regular old ways. There's extraordinary expertise out there. You know, I think about the commercial investments right now in these new entertainment domains like VR and augmented reality is probably nearer term and has even more application. That if you can slipstream behind as you start to conceive and model the sort of futures that you'll be responsible for securing, if you will, the faster that starts to happen and the more big tent opportunities that you create what if we were having this event at South by Southwest, which is going on right now? Who would be in the room with us? What kind of conversations would be happening afterwards? You know, the approaches that we take, we can make steps that are incremental and we can make leaps. And we're gonna have to do both, I think, in engaging these different parts of our society, you know, in the US, but also at a, at a global level too. Now, when we're thinking about what it's gonna be like to wake up in this world of artificial intelligence, this world of robotics. There's a vision of like what people want us to think it's gonna be like, like this $3,500 refrigerator that will check your email, and what it might actually be like. Whether it's privacy, whether it's norms around the way we want to live in our daily lives. This is a propaganda poster, by the way, that's part of that same series uh, by an artist named Bill McMullen who's done everything from Beastie Boys album covers uh, to, to Go Sleep themed art. Um, and it is a really great way to engage these conversations about how do we really understand what our day-to-day -day patterns are gonna be like when we're in wartime and everybody has an Alexa talking to them in the morning, giving them updates on the, uh, the, the battles of the day. What is it gonna be like when we've been asking our quadcopters to follow our kids to school so we don't have to walk them for quadcopter parenting of the future. 
can we, can we trust those anymore? Will we trust our autonomous vehicles uh, when we know the power of hackers you know, on the industrial uh, IoT already out there in vulnerable systems that will have expertise that can be applied even to these bespoke and custom AI uh, and systems like that. When, when we want to try to understand the societies of, of tomorrow, we're really often thinking in a linear matter. And like I said, in the matter of parenting, in the matter of how we want to think about privacy, all these fit into the narratives that we start to tell ourselves in peacetime that will be incredibly important in wartime. And being able to shift from one to the other, I think, is incredibly important because we're not always going to know when we've gone through that, across that Rubicon, gone through that doorway. Uh, the boundaries are, of course, becoming much more blurred between conflict and peace. And yet we can't, of course, abide a society that will be at war perpetually because nobody wants to actually live in a society like that. And so how we relate to innovation, how do we keep the imperative of the commercial world but apply it in the national security sector? You know, the Internet of Things, as it overlays with machine learning, is going to be a really, really interesting world to live in. When there is a, literally a limitless amount of data, you're going to be struggling to not look at data rather than harvest it up. This sort of fourth dimension, as I try to, at least in my own history major mind, think about it, allows us to have both hyper-personal but also extremely powerful mass mountains of information that can be useful in a security context, but also in a positivist sense to make our lives more interesting and richer. The amount of investment we know is there. You know, GE's forecasts of uh, industrial IoT investment, they expect uh, 60 trillion to be invested during the next decade and a half. You know, estimates around devices alone, the IHS has 70 billion devices in a decade. Think of all the IP addresses out there from a military perspective that you now have to cope with. You know, can you now understand a population or a domain via the data without actually ever talking to a person? Because you can literally see, based on the information you're being fed from everything from clothing to consumer electronics devices for entertainment, how, how a population's respiratory rate is, uh, knowing that there is stressor indicated in a certain village. Well, why is that? Do you look into that? If that's a sort of science fiction, as you would say, that is increasingly going to be coming close to reality, especially when a lot of these technologies start to come together at the same time and start to synthesize. So while we may not have this you know, fridge that really is our locus of our family experience, we know robots are going to play an increasingly important part of our life. Now, I've often thought that the most valuable thing a robot might be able to do in a house is actually just make all my technology work better together, to make sure my phone's charged, to make sure that the you know, operating system on the TV is updated, to make sure that um, the, the basic cybersecurity you know, practices that you're supposed to have as a smart consumer are being, are being implemented. It may not even be something as exciting as it doing your laundry or cooking your dinner. And there's downsides to technology, right? This is something that is one of the dystopian threads in science fiction that I'm often really drawn to. There's a big debate in science fiction, how dystopian should we be? You know, David Brin, who's one of my favorite writers and favorite people, uh, would make the case that we need to be more positive and see science and science fiction as, as part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, someone who grew up reading William Gibson and, and, and is just enamored with the kind of, let's figure out how, something, how to break something and, and, and take it apart. I find myself torn personally as a writer in exploring that. The way I resolved that in a book like Ghost Sleep was to show that individuals, not technology, are part of the solution, or are, I should say are the solution. <laughs> that the kinds of ideas and hope that is the American story, I would like to think, is that we can overcome problems, even massive, surmountable, uh, almost seemingly insurmountable technological ones through our own innovation, investment, and, uh, and resourcefulness, and willingness to break rules. We have some big challenges ahead when it comes to AI and robotics. Automation in the labor market is one that I'm acutely interested in right now. You know, this is uh, just a screenshot from the website of Auto, which is a company that was acquired by Uber uh, for, I think it was around $680 million uh, last year. You know, what Auto has been able to do is show, I think very graphically, on TV with a Budweiser delivery that was essentially robot done. Uh, is that one of the most popular jobs in the U.S., you know, by, by number, truck driving, is, is in peril. So 
what if we start thinking about this factor for the army that robots aren't necessarily an existential threat from an adversary perspective, but from an internal perspective? Do we need to spend more time thinking about force implications for what our service, what our nation is going to look like when its services uh, are dramatically smaller? You know, we've seen some of the contentious hearings, the town halls around BRAC, you know, over the last few decades. But what if BRAC is driven by robotic autom automation? What if some of the very basic questions about a standing army's value to a society haven't been asked yet, but have to be confronted for budget, for policy, or political reasons? This is a screenshot from uh, a group that was uh, trying to keep Fort Benning from, from being bracked further uh, a little while back. Imagine like you're at Fort Benning, it's dawn, right? The blinking red lights, the jump towers are, are no more because that mission is now that robotic one. Peden Field's still there. Dirty name is still there on Peden Field. Don't ask me how I know. Uh, they, you still prep soldiers there for ranger school. You know, but when they get to ranger school, the cadre aren't human. Because who better to actually gauge and assess those are the kind of sci-fi far-flung outcomes that are worth thinking about. I'm not saying that any one of those visions is right, that any one of those visions is even accurate, but those are the kind of experiments that if you don't start thinking about and contemplating creatively in an engaging way with as many people as possible, you may not have the right answers for when it comes time to really answer, to, to confront those, those questions. You know, thinking about those assumptions that we're already seeing tested in the Navy, you know, with the DDG-1000, the LCS, the reduced crew levels, trying to, trying to cope with life at sea there. It's a funny anecdote that someone told me about LCS where they brought a Roomba aboard because there were so few people that I believe even the, 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 the commander of the, the vessel was sweeping, like broom sweeping, right? They didn't have enough people to keep the, keep the ship clean. So they got a Roomba, and it worked great. And the new, and the new, and everyone, you know, cut their sweeping by a certain amount of hours. Because when you're on undermanned vessel, everyone has to get involved. Everyone gets dirty. But yet, there's a new commanding officer aboard, and the room was like, first thing off the ship. We don't do that, right? So cultural resistance that we have to these sorts of innovations. You can make a step on one side of the, the line, and then you, you write back on the other because you weren't ready for that change. That's the kind of anecdote that I think is fascinating because it underscores this basic human problem. I want to take the last 10 minutes or so and come to some questions. I didn't have a Venn diagram, but I do have this kind of goofy diagram, which is just to make the point that a lot of the really basic assumptions and the language we use to talk about how we process, how we innovate, you know, take John Boyd's OODA loop, right? What does that look like in the era of ubiquitous data human on the loop, in the loop, with machine learning, cognitive enhancements. You know, what if all we're really doing is just supervising the orient act because the decision making and the observing is better done by a machine? You know, you can have your own version of this, of course, but the idea is that we really got to go back to some of these basic precepts and confront them head on uh, and have fun with them. Could you use this as a, as a creative cue for a short story or a scene a panel in a graphic novel? Absolutely. Uh, and that's the kind of work that we're trying to do further, of course, at the Atlantic Council with the Art of the Future project. I'll just leave you with, uh, with kind of four kind of basic points. Um, like I said, test your assumptions, try to break them, and do it with narrative. Invite the voices who don't belong, which is, I would consider myself one of them here today, and I, again, I'm grateful for the chance to, to address you all. Create conditions that are fictional, before, they, before the stakes really matter so that they don't equal disaster. Have your failures on the page, not in real life. And spend time in those sci-fi traffic jams. You know, we talk a lot about the importance of the crystal ball, but I would say the mirror is probably more important because we often have to do a little more introspection about the kind of very human nature of the way we relate to technology, not just today, but even out of that 2030, 2050 uh, time horizon. Thank you all. Uh, I'll take some questions. We've got about 15 minutes, I hope, and, uh, and uh, We'll uh, wait for the mic to come so we can have our online audience hopefully hear you too.
The, um, I had a question about the uh, who commissions versus who creates versus who consumes these types of things. And I, it, have you come across what seems to be a good formula for that generationally? Because many of us will want to create or commission this to be done, but then it would seem in, intuitively that it would be a younger person to do it or like the Battlefield One example, but then it's then who consumes that as a decision maker that's much older than the creator. It, it, I'm just curious if you had any that's thoughts on that. That's a really good that. question. I, we found from our approach of trying to ensure that we're having as broad of an audience engaged when we run one of our contests. An example would be, um, so I read William Gibson's The Peripheral, which uh, if you read any of the books that I've suggested, I would put that one at the top of your list, in part because I was incredibly interested in how he depicted uh, the veterans in his book, and, and particularly the, the, the medical conditions that one of uh, the main characters had. He'd been wearing haptic suits in the Marine Corps recon and was not well afterwards. And I started thinking, well, what, what is going to be the next TBI or, or, or other sort of undiagnosed, you know, at a policy level, at a personal level, challenge that, that the armed forces are going to have to confront for a future conflict? And so we ran a short story contest on that, right? And we had a really interesting mix of people enter from graduate students to you know, current active duty. On the panel for that event, we had uh, Dr. Linda Spoonster Swartz, policy official from the VA, herself a v uh, Vietnam veteran. We had uh, Maxwell Neely Cohen, a young writer who had been writing not so much about science fiction in the future, but about kind of youth and technology. And, and the idea is that you want to create a environment, both creatively, like you, like you said, but also in the kind of policy engagement side of it, because we want this to be useful that ensures that, that the voices that you're bringing to that room are gonna be heard. You know, we, we did a contest on the future of space conflict, um, and we pushed that date out for that, that contest, contest out to 2090, which is really much farther than we normally would, but we felt like we needed people to stretch intellectually to, to really think some creative thoughts. The person that won that contest at the time was a 19-year-old college student. Um, you know, these, are, these were judged blindly. It was uh, David Brin, in fact, who even picked the winner. We brought him to the Atlantic Council and put him on stage next to David Brin, who you know, is, is much older than that. So he's like, David Brin's 30, I'm just kidding, if he's listening. Um, you know, so, so you have to do both, uh, and you may not hit it, hit it every time. I mean, this is experimental work. You know, there are things that we have not succeeded at very well. Uh, our outreach to the graphic novel community, I, I felt like I was really disappointed with, and I, I take that failure on me. Um, but we have, so I see that therefore as a lot more room to kind of go uh, and just keep trying, keep, keep experimenting. So on, a, uh, on a, uh, a question related to autonomy, robotics, and artificial intelligence, there's potentially a lot of parallels with the Hill hmm. in that regard, but uh, on, a, on a more serious note, could you not see those same applications, uh, talking about relieving uh, the stress of the soldier and other things, but also for the bureaucracy at the Pentagon for a lot of the day-to-day -day business functions. So right now, new Secretary Mattis is looking at you know, wholesale changes in terms of how to get more efficiencies in the enterprise. And if you combine that autonomy of robotics and artificial intelligence, there's a lot of serial processes that potentially could benefit from that. So I'd like your thoughts. It would be a really boring story, but it would be an incredibly important one to write. Um, I, I think that sort of understanding what I love about that question is that's part of like the biggest problem we face, right? How to deal with, with the tail, you know? And the, that's a cost issue, it's a political issue. It seems like a really ripe area to apply technology to. And I actually bet you could write some interesting fiction about that. I bet you could do that. Uh, and that might be a good challenge I'll try to take on. Uh, August, uh, did anybody try to measure quantitatively how accurate are the uh, predictions of science fiction. In other words, if we use FICINT, FICINT that you uh, suggested, what will be this signal to noise ratio, to put it in mad scientific terms? Sure. I, the, I think the, the power in it is less prediction than it is shaping, that it is creating frameworks. Uh, I think anybody who tries to use science fiction to predict anything is gonna be frustrated uh, there are times when I think we have, like I said, seen some pretty interesting predictive writing done, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle and Unrestricted uh, Undersea Warfare is, I think, a good example. But we're also at a point where 
we don't know how fast certain technologies are going to evolve, whether it's quicker than we expect or slower. So, so when, I, when I position it in that kind of fickent sense, my hope is that it's something that allows us to enrich a conversation and not try to be something that supplants or displaces, because I think that would be unwise as much as I, as I find that intriguing. Um, Uh, so I was wondering if you could comment on sort of the hazards of using that kind of of using science fiction as a shaping device because fiction has a lot of tropes and biases already baked into it and I see a lot of that actually seep into real more serious debate uh, for instance for artificial intelligence there's a great and classic trope of AI is very powerful but the creativity and unpredictability of humans is the thing that brings its downfall and that's how we win and I've met that response in real life, but there's certain uh, technological advances like a CMU's poker bot that shows that a lot of these human strengths and these human interactions might not all be that relevant when in that kind of a situation. So I was wondering if you could comment on how yeah. to avoid those kinds of biases. So I think you have to be really careful of, of confirming biases through these sorts of you know, creative, I mean this is one of I think the biggest challenges for example with video games which are akin to now more like blockbuster films. You're gonna have less variety and, uh, and, and potentially kind of truly game changing intellectual concepts. You know, as an example, uh, of, a, of a game that did not come from a big studio, but there's a, a, a PC-based game called This War of Mine, when the purpose of it is essentially to you know, play the role of a civilian who's trying not to more or less starve to death or be bludgeoned to death by their neighbors. And it's a really powerful, depressing game, very, very effective at really forcing you to sit on the other side of the table, which is something that good storytelling does. Uh, it's by a studio in Poland. And, and so I think that's that risk of you know, confirming biases through, you know, fancy, flashy things is real. You know, one of the ways I think is also just to, to do more work to read more widely, for example. Uh, there's some really great science fiction, also Chinese, um, called Invisible Planets. It's an anthology of different short stories that I would recommend, it's in English translated, um, that allows you to, again, you know, see what other societies and cultures are producing and how they think about the future. Uh, that's an area of acute interest uh, on my part, and, and I think all of us can kind of take that, take that responsibility on. So in, in, uh, in Ghost Fleet, um, in the beginning, we kind of get our, our, our butts handed to us in space. Space is taken away from us, and a private citizen comes in and saves the day. Uh, but at the end of the, of the conflict, it's still a state-on-state state, uh, conflict, you know, given uh, the things that we're dealing with with non-state actors, um, and you know, we've had minor discussions of globalism recently. Um, do you think state-on-state state is what the future is going to hold? I think the state-on-state state conflict is increasingly likely, but it's going to look different than the state-on-state state conflict of the past. That you might see non-state actors in the employ for both positive, not just negative, uh, contexts. You know, what would what would Jeff Bezos do? during a, a great power war, you know, between the cloud computing power they have uh, within Amazon to uh, Blue uh, Origin to our other, you know, space billionaires that we experimented with in, in the novel. So I would say that you're going to see this state-on-state -state risk of conflict not going away, but it's going to have a different quality to it where you may see, again, non-state actors having negative and positive roles, whether it's hackers who are aligned out of convenience either to defend the internet or to take down a target they've wanted to uh, exact vengeance upon for a long time. I, I think we have to be so, aware of that. So you're suggesting that the Washington Post would conduct information warfare? <laughs> As a former journalist, I wouldn't say anything like that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, uh, Alpha Crane from Arctic. Um, I have two questions. Um, one uh, is, um, how can we as a DOD better use the creative world to inform our own? And we had been talking about that for an hour, but maybe how we can better inform the uh, creative community what we're looking for, that exchange of information, because we, we're starting to breach out and break out of our molds of you know poo-pooing science fiction to maybe actually using it as something that can inform our future so we can at least prepare for something. 
And my second question is, um, as a senior in high school, I spent numerous hours playing Red Storm Rising, the PC game on a 386, listening to the soundtrack for Hunt for Red October, and I was wondering if there's going to be a game for Ghost Fleet. <laughs> uh, on, on the latter point, no, no, no plans for a game for Ghost Fleet. But you know, when when we wrote that, and when I write too, and I think very visually, uh, because I think that's an effective way to engage people. Um, to your other point about how do you you know connect if you're within Arctic or or other you know organizations, you know I think it is about you know, bringing people like me to, to a, a setting like this. It's about, you know, engaging with Art of the Future project, you know, finding ways to reach not only the established voices, though, in those creative communities, but the new ones, the ones that haven't been heard yet. Uh, so I think those are two kind of really good kind of approaches towards, towards you know, capturing some of this momentum out there. And, and I have to say, you know, like with the military fellows whose work I, I highlighted, there's an incredible amount of creativity uh, resident within any one of your organizations that's both present in their just day-to-day -day lives because uh, military life requires an incredible amount of creativity, uh, but also there are people who are actually excellent illustrators and writers uh, and certainly, I'm sure, videographers and cinematographers too, uh, thinking about the future uh, and trying to understand you know, some of these questions with the same intensity, but just with different tools. Last question. Last question. So I have a question in regards to your creative process and toolkit. When it comes to visualizing the world, uh, like for Ghost Fleet and kind of the um, the complexity that that goes into how they're going to fight, what are the the political economic dynamics that are going on? Uh, being able to understand how do you come up with that to be able to take that kind of complex mess and, and and make it simple and to put it into context from multi-domain battle perspective. We're talking about interoperability and, and integration across five separate domains, uh, all of which, you know, having something to do with the other, um, and, and trying to tackle that from a visualization perspective. I mean, one of the cardinal rules that I've employed with a lot of the short stories I've written, I wrote one um, called Underbelly recently about how would NATO, particularly UK-led, uh, operate against Russia without US help? Uh, in the near future, right? So to do that, I thought, what rules do I need to break? You know, what assumptions do I need to kind of break over my leg, right? Just just snap them right in half. And then what would what would the adversary do? And can I do that first or better or more deviously than him uh, or her? And and that was a big driver in Ghost Fleet was putting our kind of red team hat on um, and and collaborating. And I, I find that the collaboration piece is incredibly important when you are dealing with these big complex worlds. And particularly if you're trying to create a multi-character story in them, uh, you, really, you really benefit from having uh, a team approach. You know, because when you write a book, it's not just sitting by the cabin you know, next to the burbling brook. It's, it's a lot of just banging it out on the keyboard, but also you know, coming, up, coming to resolution in really hard conversations about you keep a character or not. You know, are you giving enough attention to the home front in Ghost Sleep, for example? You know, could have done a lot more with that, but we had to make decisions. Uh, and you're editing out facts, you're editing out information. Because there is always a sweet spot in world building. There's, there is certainly you know, times when you've read things and you're just thinking too much or not enough. I want to hear more. This needs to be more fully developed. So it's a bit of, a, a bit of I guess, art to that. You know, but, but the collaboration helps, and so does the, the thinking about it in a very kind of devious way. Thank you.